normally if, the, if your muscle tone is unaffected by MS, we can just move a joint passively. If I grabbed your arm or your leg, I can move it. With spasticity, you start feeling tightness. And when we talk about velocity dependent, the faster I move it, the more it tightens up. That's important when we think about stretching with multiple sclerosis, because with stretching, we want to kind of be slow and gentle, otherwise we can really make that spasticity kick up for us. And some of you probably see that in real life if you do a movement that's a little bit too fast, you may feel a sudden tightening up. We tend to see a hyper excitability of stretch reflexes. So stretch reflexes are, if you, know, if you tap a tendon like in your knee or in your arm, you get a reflex where that, the, you get a little jerk. And we see hyperexcitability of that in, in spasticity. So what is spasticity versus a spasm? And you may have both of these things. Spasticity means the chronic state of your muscle being too tight. So it's too tight all of the time. A spasm is a wave of, of increased muscle tone. So it could, you could have an extensor spasm so that your legs stiffen out. You can have a flexor spasm so your arms tighten up. You can also have extensor spasms in your trunk so that your whole body stiffens out. Typically spasms are uncomfortable if not outright painful to people. So, so what's going on with, with spasticity? Everything in, in, as it relates to muscle tone in the human body is a balance between excitatory uh, influences and stimuli and inhibitory stimuli. And what this translates to is a balance between what the muscles that want to extend and muscles that want to flex. So if you leave the spinal cord to its own devices, it has certain things it wants your muscles to do. It typically, if the spinal cord is just left alone, it wants your legs to stiffen out and it wants your arms to flex. Well, the brain is gonna sort of come into play and the brain is gonna sort of have inhibitory uh, influences over those. It's gonna say, no, we're gonna tone that down a little bit. The brain sends a message to the spinal cord. The spinal cord relays a message to something called the alpha uh, motor neuron to tone down that, that uh, increased muscle tone. So you can have spasticity as a result of injuries to your brain, so it can be of cerebral origin, or you can have spasticity as a result of injury to the spinal cord. In multiple sclerosis, you have the potential to have both. You can have injuries at both the brain level and the spinal cord level. So if you have MS plaques in the brain, you're losing that ability of the brain to send that that sort of toning down inhibitory uh, sort of uh, stimulus down to the spinal cord and say, just relax a little bit. If you have lesions in your spinal cord, you also can't get that message from the brain. So you're, you're blocking the ability of the spinal cord to send that, that sort of relaxing message to the muscles themselves. And so with the spinal cord, you're dealing with everything from the base of your brain, from C1 all the way down to T12. That's all spinal cord. So one of the questions sometimes we get is with multiple sclerosis is why when we do your MRIs, why am I not looking at your lumbar spine? Why don't we go lower down? That's because in the lumbar spine there's no spinal cord. That's part of your lower motor uh, neuron system uh, or your peripheral nervous system. So if you look at the, the diagrammatic there, so your spinal cord stops at T12. If you feel the top of your hip and you sort of come over to your back, that's L4-5. If you go about that much above the top of your hip, that's where your spinal cord ends. So multiple sclerosis only affects the myelin in your brain down to T12. So we're, that's one of the reasons we're not so much interested in doing your lumbar spine with, with multiple sclerosis is because there's no spinal cord down there. If we're looking at your lumbar spine, it's to look for something affecting the nerve roots after they've left the spinal cord, which would be completely unrelated to your MS. So what do we see in, in the real world uh, in terms of signs of spasticity? We see hyperactive deep tendon reflexes. When we tap on your knee or we tap on your arm, that reflex is normally graded at a two. The scale for grading your deep tendon reflexes goes from zero to four. Two is where most people live. Zero means I tap on your, your knee and I get nothing whatsoever. At a one, I'm getting just a little trace. Two is normal. Three is a hyperactive deep tendon reflex. We sometimes call those get back reflexes. Uh, if we tap on your knee and we don't get back, you're probably gonna kick us. 
if we tap on a reflex or if we tap on the, the bottom of your, push on the bottom of your foot and we get a sustained bouncing, that's a four. That's called sustained clonus. And you can actually do that to yourself sometimes with multiple sclerosis. If you get your leg in just the, the wrong position, you may find that suddenly your leg starts bouncing like that. That's clonus. What you're doing is you're causing a deep tendon reflex to fire over and over and over again. And until you move the leg, it's going to keep doing that. So that's a, that is a sign of spasticity or, or hyperactive deep tendon reflexes. So muscle spasms can be a sign of, of uh, spasticity, the clonus that we just mentioned. Pain, these spasms can be painful for, for people. Um, impaired voluntary muscle movement. So if the muscle, for instance, with the, with the leg, if your leg wants to extend out and, and push itself into the floor, well, that's gonna make it very hard for you to move that, that leg and walk. Sometimes it's hard for us to separate out what's weakness and what's spasticity. Some people with MS will say, when I first get up out of a chair, or maybe in the morning after I've been sleeping, I'll get up and my, my feet feel like they're glued to the floor. They're just, they weigh a thousand pounds and I can't walk. That could be weakness. It could also be spasticity. It could be that your spasticity is driving your legs into extension and pushing your feet into the floor so it makes it very difficult for you to move, uh, move your legs. The MS hug, it, when we say hug, you would think that that would be something pleasant, but unfortunately this is like being hugged by a grizzly bear. It's not so pleasant. So this is usually a form of spasticity. When you think about the nerve roots that come off of our spinal cord, the nerve roots supply muscle bands between your rib cage, and those muscles can uh, spasm just like any other muscle in your body. And when they spasm, they tend to spasm like a belt going around your chest or around your abdomen. If they spasm enough in the chest, you can actually get something called a restrictive ventilatory defect. So what a restrictive ventilatory defect is, is a person with MS feeling like they can't take a full breath. It makes you feel short of breath, which is a little bit scary, but if we measure your blood oxygen levels, they're actually gonna be completely normal. So it's a sensation that you're not getting enough air when you actually are. Now, if you ever have shortness of breath for some reason, we don't want you to assume that it's just from your MS hug. We medically, want, we want you to get checked out, but sometimes what we find is that it really is this MS hug causing a restrictive ventilatory uh, defect. Um, the way we would manage that is not by treating your lungs because it's not a lung problem, it's a muscle problem on the outside. We would do things to try to, to expand those, the, the sort of the, loosen up those muscles, use the things that we're gonna talk about in a minute to treat muscle spasms and spasticity. It seems strange when we're talking about spasticity to say, well, sometimes there can be some good things about spasticity, but there can be possible advantages to it. It can help you maintain muscle tone uh, and actually uh, keep the muscles a little bit on the strong side because in some ways you are using the muscle when it's, when it's tight. It can help support circulatory function. When you think about blood flow, to the legs and blood flow getting back out, blood getting out of the legs, you have arterial pressure that drives blood down into your feet. Well, what gets blood out of the legs is muscle contraction, muscle squeezing, and that blood going up the vein, and we have one-way valves in the vein that doesn't let the blood go back down. So sometimes spasms can actually help with, with lower extremity edema, with the swelling in, in your feet. It can help you pr prevent deep uh, venous thromboses at, at times. And then probably the most important thing from a practical standpoint is sometimes we can use increased muscle tone in the legs to actually help with activities of daily living. So for instance, if you go to transfer from, from a chair uh, to the bed or to the toilet and your legs are very weak, but now when you transfer, the legs want to stiffen out on you, we can actually use that increased muscle tone to help with transfers. So it can help mask weakness in some people. So what are some of the bad things that go along with, with spasticity? Well, obviously it can be painful. Uh, it also impairs function, and that's probably the most bothersome thing. So it, if you have enough tightness in your legs that you can't walk very well, sometimes when people have extensor spasticity in the legs, when the legs stiffen out, they don't just stiffen out, they actually cross over one another. It's called scissoring. And if your legs scissor when you're trying to walk, well, you're gonna, it's gonna be difficult to walk and you're gonna trip yourself. If you have too much tone in the arms, it makes it difficult to, to do activities of daily living, whether it's using your phone, eating, using a keyboard, so when the spasticity becomes painful or makes you less functional, that's when it's a problem. 
So spasticity can be very uh, stimulus responsive. What that means is if you do something that irritates your body, your spasticity can get worse. And just about anything that you can think of can be a potential uh, noxious stimulus that can make spasticity worse. Some of the big ones that we see are urinary tract infections, kidney stones, upper respiratory infections, pneumonias, something like a, a, a poor seating position in a wheelchair or a scooter, or a brace on your foot, an ankle fo foot orthotic that doesn't fit well, a shoe that doesn't fit well, a sock that's irritating. Any of these things can actually set off and worsen spasticity. Constipation well, will do it for a lot of people. So we're gonna speak in just a moment about you know, managing spasticity, and one of the first things that we do when we try to manage spasticity is we look for some of the things on this list and say, is there something on there that we could get rid of that might, might help with your spasticity? So we traditionally think of a step ladder, kind of a stepwise approach to managing spasticity. And kind of at the bottom of the step, the first goal would be getting rid of those noxious stimuli, try to take away things that would irritate. Next step up would be rehabilitation therapy. So stretching, working with a physical therapist, kind of net, next notch up is gonna be your oral medications. And then we think of, of intrathecal baclofen, which we'll spend some time talking about. So this is the way that our, we traditionally grade our treatments, but this is probably not really the most realistic way. In reality, it's more of a circle. So it's not like we say, okay, we're only gonna remove noxious stimuli, that doesn't work, so now we're gonna ignore that. Now we're gonna move on to just stretching. If that doesn't get us where we want, we're gonna ignore that. In reality, we're using all of these things frequently at the same time in a, in a given individual. We never want to forget about managing those UTIs. We never want to forget about the stretching program. Even if something, someone goes to the route of, of intrathecal baclofen, one of our more aggressive treatments, you never want to forget those, the, the bottom of the ladder and continue to do those things. So the goals of spasticity management, really it's to make you more functional and to keep you as comfortable as humanly possible. So that you really could summarize all of these things. We're sometimes making caregivers' lives easier also um, by, by helping manage with, with uh, transfers or getting the person sleeping better through the night so that both, both people, you know, a person with MS and uh, their uh, significant others sleep better through the night. We say stretching like everyone would just automatically know what to do with stretching, but, but there are specific stretches that may be beneficial to an individual that a physical therapist can give you sort of a, a program with. So sometimes when people are first dealing with spasticity, I like for them to visit with a physical therapist for an hour or two just to get a list of things to do at home uh, to, to help stretch. Uh, sort of doing weight bearing, so if a person can't walk, what if we could get them in, uh, down to physical therapy and put them in a standing frame to really help stretch some of those muscles out and, and uh, have some weight bearing. Um, Botox. Botox is, can be a great treatment, but it's a very specific treatment. When we inject Botox into a muscle, we're paralyzing that muscle for a period of time, usually for about three months. So if we're going to paralyze a muscle with Botox, we want to make sure that you don't need that muscle to, 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 uh, to carry out activities of daily living. So that's usually where we're going to bring on board a physical medicine and rehabilitation specialist and let them help us gauge which muscles could we potentially use Botox for. Serial casting. So what serial casting is, is a physical therapist. Let's say you have an arm that's held in flexion. So this muscle is really, really tight and you can't bend it. Well, what the physical therapist is gonna do with serial casting is they're gonna sort of put a cast on just as if you've broken that arm and just have it bend out, extend out a little bit. You're gonna leave that on for, for maybe a, a week or so and then they're gonna take it off and put another one on that bends it, straightens it out a little bit more and just sequentially try to straighten that muscle out as much as you can uh, to, to help with that, that muscle tightness. Um, aquatics therapy can be a great way to work with spasticity. If we take sometimes a, a person and put them into an, a, a sort of a, a weightless situation, we can maybe um, move them in ways that they can't just if we we're in a bed or a chair or in a usual therapy setting. So I wanted to just, if at a minimum, so let's say that you're just having a little bit of issues with tightness in your legs. Maybe you're waking up at night with the legs spasming some, but you're not on a medication yet. Maybe it's not tremendously bothersome. These are two really easy things you can do at home. And I would say you can't stretch too much. So if you could spend you know, 10 minutes a day 
great. If you want to spend an hour a day stretching, even better. We know we have busy lives, but you, you can't spend too much time stretching. So if you could do two stretches, so if you think about weakness and spasticity in the legs, the two muscles that are most commonly affected are the calf muscle, which is gonna to wanna to drive your foot down. So you kinda of get a double whammy. So the, the, the weakness typically affects the front part of your calf, the ankle dorsiflexors, so you can't bring your foot up. And then you've got the big back muscle, your gastrocnemius, that wants to be tight and drive your foot down. So sometimes that foot drop is a combination of spasticity driving it down and weakness not letting it come up. So if we can work on the spasticity by having you put a towel or a TheraBand, one of those overgrown rubber bands, under the bottom of your foot and just pull gently up. When you get, and again, it's slow and easy, pull up to the point where it's a little bit uncomfortable, hold it there for about a minute, then work on the other side. So the other muscle that's gonna be tight in a person with multiple sclerosis is the front part of the leg, the, the, uh, the, the quad muscles. And to stretch those, you wanna do something that looks like a runner stretch. If you can stand up and do it, great. If you have to lie down and do it, that's okay too. With the runner stretch, what you're gonna do is grab the front part of your leg and just pull your heel back towards your butt and then just pull it gently until you feel that front part of your thigh muscle stretching out. Again, just a couple of minutes, a couple of times a day will, could make a big difference. I, I like seeing people do a little bit of stretching if they can before they go to bed so that maybe they have a better chance of sleeping through the night without their legs waking them up being uncomfortable. So medications, you know, perfect world, we would never have to use medications to manage uh, various symptoms in MS, but with spasticity, sometimes we do have to look at medications. Baclofen is probably the most commonly used medication. It's been around forever. There are good things and bad things about baclofen. Benzodiazepines, this is the big chemical class of things like clonazepam, diazepam or Valium. These have got, these do work. So in, in these medications do a lot of different things. They can relax you, they can sedate you and help you sleep. Um, they can be used to treat epilepsy and they also are, are really good muscle relaxants. The downside is they do have some addictive potential. Um, of that class, probably the one that has the least potential for addiction or tolerance would be clonazepam or clonopin. The longer the benzodiazepine stays in your system, the less likely it is that you're gonna get tolerant or addicted to it. So clonazepam has the longest half-life of any of those drugs. Xanax would be one that has the shortest half-life. Xanax probably has the highest potential for abuse and, and, and addiction and tends, tends to have the highest street value. These drugs have gotten a little challenging to prescribe because of some of the state laws. Uh, uh, the state of Georgia passed a law a few years ago uh, that was really uh, geared at going after opioids. What they wanted to do is cut down on some of the pill mills out there. And so they required that anytime we prescribe an opioid, a hydrocodone, an oxycontin, that we go onto a Georgia database and we look that individual up to make sure they're not getting this prescription from five different doctors. Well, they also included benzodiazepines in this class. So a lot of our individuals on clonazepam, now we have to go into this database. Uh, it means that we, ideally we would be seeing the person on an every three month basis. Sometimes we can push a little bit and go to every six months, um, but it, it has added another layer of kind of bureaucratic hassle. Dantrolene is an interesting uh, drug in our world, in the MS world, um, you don't see a lot of dantrolene used. It doesn't work as well as we would like it to for spasticity and multiple sclerosis. We will sometimes try it out uh, if, if we're running short on options though. Tizanidine after baclofen would probably be the second most commonly used medication. Uh, tizanidine works differently from, from baclofen. Uh, it can be a great thing to treat spasticity with. Keppra doesn't tend to work for spasticity, but it can prevent spasms. So if you're just having waves of painful uh, muscle tightening, sometimes Keppra is something we'll throw into the mix. And then cannabinoids. So these are your, your uh, active ingredients in, in marijuana. So we have some synthetics. We've got dronabinol or marinol, which is FDA approved for nausea in chemotherapy patients. It is synthetic THC uh, with no CBD to it. Um, we've tried this occasionally. We've had some success with it uh, for treating spasticity. Um, Sativex. Sativex is, is, the, is a real deal CBD THC in a sublingual spray. It is a one-to-one -one mixture of CBD and THC. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And then other cannabis products. So shifting just for a second back to baclofen and tizanidine, 
typically the rule with these drugs is you want to start with a, a, a small dose and gently increase that dose. And what we will do with baclofen or tizanidine is we're gonna go up on the dose until one of two things happens. Either you're happy or you're sleepy. And so if you get control of your spasticity and spasms and you're not sedated, that's great. We're gonna leave you at that dose. If you get sedated before you get to that point, we're probably gonna back off and try something else. We do use the two together at times. They do have different mechanisms of action and they can complement uh, one another. You know, some general things that we kind of watch out for. Back, I always tell people, I can give you enough baclofen that we can control most, most of your spasticity and your spasms. The question is, am I gonna knock you out before you get there, or am I gonna make, turn you into a rag doll? So baclofen can unmask underlying weakness. And so in some people they'll say, yeah, my, my muscles are not as tight, but I don't walk as well because my, now my legs are floppy. Um, one of the precautions with baclofen is that if you are taking it on a regular basis, um, you don't want to abruptly stop the drug. There is some seizure risk uh, if you stop baclofen abruptly. If you are on a big dose of baclofen uh, and you were to stop that abruptly, the seizures could actually be life-threatening. If you're only taking baclofen at bedtime just to help you get through the night and that's your only dose, you can stop that without much difficulty. But if you're taking it throughout the day, that's the dose that you don't want to stop abruptly. So shifting uh, to the, the uh, cannabinoids, so what we know is that if you have mixtures of CBD and THC, that these can be very effective treatments for spasms and spasticity. CBD oil, hemp-based CBD oil is everywhere out there. And you, they sell it at, you know, at the, the corner grocery store, at the gas station, at the vape shops, online on Amazon. Uh, hemp-based CBD is legal in all 50 states. So hemp is the cousin of marijuana. It does not have the gene to make THC. We've not found CBD oil without THC to be very helpful in managing spasticity. I wish it was. It's available everywhere. It's easy to get. It's not really uh, regulated to any large degree. Where we tend to see just pure CBD oil helping out is if you just have trouble turning your brain off at night. You just want to sleep a little bit better. Uh, if you have some anxiety, I've seen CBD work for that. I've not been impressed with what it does for, for uh, spasticity and spasms in MS. Um, there is science behind CBD and THC, so there was a, a study just published in August of this year that looked at 14 other studies and put all of that data together and looked at a one-to-one -one mixture of CBD, THC, and an uh, oral mucosal spray. This is basically Sativex, which we're going to talk more uh, about in a second. And what they found when you looked across those studies is that people reported a decrease in spasticity and spasms ranging from 42% to 83%. So it was a significant improvement for, for these individuals. So what is Sativex? And this is something that you should probably know about because I do think at some point it will be FDA approved. So Sativex is made by GW Pharmaceuticals uh, in, the, in the UK. It is a one-to-one -one mixture of CBD and THC from, the, some, from cannabis, the, the marijuana plant um, that this uh, pharmaceutical company has a proprietary blend for. It has been approved for managing spasticity and spasms in multiple sclerosis in the UK, Canada, and Spain for probably 10 years. We are just on the verge of doing a phase three clinical trial uh, here in the United States, so we will be one of the sites doing this study. It's very interesting legally when you look at it, what we're having to do to start this study here at Shepherd Center. Because THC is still listed as a Schedule I drug by the DEA, so it's right up there with, with heroin and, and cocaine, we have to get a special DEA waiver, a Schedule I license, to be able to do the study here, and that's what's slowing us down. So it takes the, about six, seven months for you to get a DEA waiver to do that. So you know, once we have that, we will be starting the study. What the study is specifically looking at is pretty much all comers with multiple sclerosis, wide range of ages, relapsing MS, progressive MS, and they want to just see that it, de it decreases spasms as reported by the individual with MS. 
So shifting to probably one of the more aggressive things we can do to manage spasticity and spasms, and that would be intrathecal baclofen. So this is what a baclofen pump looks like. This is gonna be a surgically implanted pump. It's implanted just under the skin on your side, and it's about that big. Uh, and what that's going to do is deliver concentrated liquid baclofen into the spinal fluid to treat spasticity. So why would we want to do that? If you think about the way oral baclofen works versus intrathecal baclofen, there are some advantages uh, to putting the baclofen into the spinal fluid. When we take baclofen by mouth, it has to be absorbed in, in the gut, it gets into the bloodstream, and it goes to the liver first. There's something called the first pass effect. So this drug has to first pass through the liver. Well, a lot of it in the liver is just metabolized, and it doesn't go anywhere. A certain amount of the baclofen then is absorbed. Some of it crosses the blood-brain barrier and goes into our brain. That's not where we want baclofen working. We want baclofen working in your spinal cord. The part that goes into the brain itself is probably where we get the sedation from. And again, that's not what we're trying to do. If we put baclofen into the spinal fluid, it's taken up uh, through capillaries and delivered to the, directly to the spinal fluid with very little getting into the brain itself. You don't have to go through the liver to get there first. So you can use very small amounts of baclofen and deliver it exactly what, where you want the baclofen to work to get the effect. So this, is, to me, is, is fascinating. So this looks at two different doses of baclofen and shows how much of it gets into the spinal fluid where you want it working at. So if I give you 60 milligrams of oral baclofen, um, that's a pretty decent dose to take all at, all at once. What we can see is that the amount that gets into the spinal fluid when we measured it was 0.024 micrograms per milliliter. So 60 milligrams is equivalent, equivalent to 60,000 micrograms. Now go down and look at the, the intrathecal baclofen. So if I give you 600 micrograms over, the, over 24 hours, as opposed to 60,000 micrograms, look how much more I'm getting into the spinal fluid where it should be working at. I'm getting 1.24 micrograms per ml versus 0.024. So huge difference in what's getting to where it should be with just a little tiny dose because every bit of it that I'm giving into the spinal fluid is getting where it needs to be. One thing we do know is because we're with intrathecal baclofen, we're putting it into your spinal fluid, there is a gravity effect. Unless the person's lying down or we stand you on your head, gravity is going to pull that medication down into the spinal fluid in such a way that there's more of it in the lower spinal cord than there is in the upper spinal cord. So one thing we do see sometimes is that intrathecal baclofen for the average person may work better for spasticity and spasms in your legs than it does for the arms because you're having, you have more concentration by about a four to one ratio in the lower part of your spinal uh, cord. So what's the process that by, whereby someone would, would be considered a candidate? Usually the, you're gonna have a person try some things out first. They're gonna have tried some baclofen, some tizanidine, maybe they've tried you know, a, a CBD THC product and either they didn't get the results they want or they had side effects with those things. And then we start thinking about intrathecal baclofen. Our process here is, like the, is the same process that most MS centers would use. We're gonna refer you to a team. Here that team's led by a physical medicine and rehab doctor. They're gonna review all of your medications, make sure we don't have any other options we've overlooked. And then if it looks like everything's a go, they're gonna set up a trial pump. There are two ways that that can be done. A person could just have a one-time spinal tap and have the, the intrathecal baclofen put in one time by spinal tap to see if the, the person gets what they want out of that, that intrathecal baclofen. The better way of doing it is to actually put in a temporary pump. So this is a pump that's going to be put in for 24 hours. It's going to be hooked up to an IV pole, and then you're going to get to carry out things that look more typical for your activities of daily living to see if it does what you want it to do. If that trial is successful, then you would be set up with a neurosurgeon and that pump's going to be implanted. So what are some of the advantages of it? If, if by some chance you don't like it, or let's say they put in a dose because these pumps are programmable, let's say they set the dose too high, well they can always turn the pump down and go to a lower dose. If for some reason you just didn't like the pump, they can be surgically removed. It's unusual that that happens. Usually you've been through enough of a screening process before you get one put in that it would be less likely that someone would change their mind uh, afterwards. Um, and they can be very effective in reducing spasticity. 
So what are some of the downsides to putting a pump in? Rarely they can malfunction, so you can have underdosing or overdosing. If a person is overdosed with baclofen, they can get very weak, they can get confused. If a pump malfunctions and it stops working, remember we said never stop your baclofen all at once. Well, if a pump stops working, the, you, can have, you could stop your baclofen all at once and actually have seizures as a result of it. These pumps have alarms built in, usually when they start running low, and they're designed to hold about three months worth of the medication, sometimes more if your dose is lower. Um, they have an alarm that's going to go off, and it's pretty obvious when it's, it's going off. So malfunctions are very, very rare. We do have to be aware that, that this is a piece of, of hardware in your body. When you have MRIs, we want to make sure that the big magnet that we're putting you in with the MRI hasn't caused that pump to malfunction. So if you have an MRI then you, uh, and we see you then in clinic, we do something called interrogating your pump. So what that basically means is the nurse is going to come in with, with her little laptop. She has your code for your pump. She's going to tap into your pump software and make sure that all the parameters are still the same and document all that, that we have not done anything to alter your pump settings during that, that MRI scan. But you can have MRIs if, uh, if you have a pump in. It's a surgical procedure. There's always the risk of infection. There's the risk of the anesthesia itself. These pumps are designed to last for years, but they do have to be replaced uh, periodically.